Welcome to Centaur Financial Services Podcast with your hosts, Hugh Robertson and Bobby Byrne. The information provided on and made available through this video and podcast does not constitute as financial product advice. The information is of a general nature only and does not take into account your individual objectives, financial situation or needs. It should not be used, relied upon or treated as a substitute for specific professional advice. We recommend that you obtain your own independent professional advice before making any decision in relation to your particular requirements or circumstances. Hi and welcome to Centaur's podcast. Uh, it's great to have you here today. It's a Friday afternoon. It's a little bit more informal today. Bobby and I are going to be having a beer and we're going to talk about some of the topical issues uh, that are going on in, in our clients' worlds uh, and hopefully for you that's something applicable and you can really get some value out of. Today, uh, we're going to introduce Bobby and we're going to talk about the behavioural side of investing. This might be the most topical conversation we're having with clients at this point in time, uh, especially given the current market volatility. So, welcome Bobby. Thanks you. Happy to be here on the Friday afternoon. <laughs> so, from our perspective, we're meeting with clients probably 10 times a week. Uh, we've just had Silicon Valley Bank uh, collapse, we've had Credit Suisse get bought out by UBS. And for the clients out there, what's the message to them through getting through times like this? Yeah, well, uh, it's definitely trying times. And I think you see through history, every time the Fed, the Federal Reserve, they raise rates and the RBA raises rates as quickly, something generally breaks. And it feels like we've seen that now. Mm. Um, so essentially, there'll be reverberations through the markets from this kind of fallout. But the key is that short term, we never know really what's going to happen in terms of market performance. It's just too hard to predict. So we work on long term trends that we know work historically and markets will perform as they do whilst being volatile at that time. So I think the main message is to stay the course, as hard as that might be, stay in the course. Because if you try and make these timing decisions, it's unlikely you'll be able to do that effectively and you might put yourself in a worse off uh, situation. I think we see that in the every year and if any of the clients who are watching this, we were sending out a, a report at the start of the year how we read about five, 600 pages of economic data and we were really robust and thorough and felt very confident about what this year would be after we've had, you know, we're now in year three of the COVID, you know, pandemic and the first two years were shocking. Then last year we had health related, then last year we had the consequence of inflation was worse than expected in terms of everything was going up too fast. Mm. We've then had interest rates go up at one of the most accelerated rates in history. We had bond values, bonds which are meant to be safe, went down in value, down 12, 13%. The share market, especially overseas, was down double digits. So for these clients, I think that's a really important message to stay the path, have a plan, number one, to know what you're trying to achieve and understand the history that actually volatility is normal. Uh, we often joke that the crystal ball is broken because we put in a lot of work reading to try and best forecast what's happening. But in environments like this, really, it, you just need to be able to stick to the plan. And I feel when we talk about all the things going on in the world, if you really want to be obsessed about things, you'll always find reasons why you shouldn't do something. Do you find that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look back the last 10 years, we've had that Goldilocks period, so to speak, on markets performance. I mean, interest rates coming down, quantitative easing, you know, the government's pumping money into the system. That should have been a worry-free decade. That's all tailwinds for share markets, but it wasn't. Mm. I mean, you had the uh, China-US trade war in 18. 18, um, yeah. And you had various other kind of events during that that had momentary blips. But now it's, it's almost a realignment of, how investing should be, but back to original normals with, you know, artificial rates on 0.1% or zero or even negative real rates overseas. So while it's been a painful period, I think going forward, actual investment principles come back to the forefront that have worked mm. for you know, decades. So that diversification matters, yep. time in the market matters, be an investor, not a speculator, yep. all of these things, have a plan. And I feel the, probably during COVID when there was this cheap money, uh, you know, certainly maybe 2020, 2021, I've never heard as much discussion around cryptocurrency, in particular Bitcoin, as we have now. Like now, no one's asking about it, but back then, it felt like that was everyone's ticket to financial freedom. Well, that was the thing, right? And it's kind of, it accelerated so much, I feel, because 
you know, wanted to miss out. Everyone wants mm. to get in there to get the 60%, 100% return. Yeah. Um, and it, it was just interesting, but because there was so much extra money in the system, it had to go somewhere. So I think that was a result of all the quantitative easing we had. Whereas now, you're doing the opposite, taking money out. Obviously, crypto is one of the first to go. Yeah. And you, you see that with the Silicon Valley Bank and things like that, the government guarantee the money in there, the deposits. But with crypto, there's no guarantee whatsoever. So if you lose it, it's gone. Mm. So, yeah, not really, <laughs> not really something I'd, I'd be looking at too. You would be advising your clients to go into... No, not now. It's, no, no, not now. It's crash. No, but back two years ago, absolutely. <laughs> Kidding. All jokes aside, uh, I think fund fundamentals probably in an environment like this, fundamentals matter. Mm. Your your education around knowing how markets work is really important. When we, for anyone who's who's coming in as a client, you know, we we tend to talk about diversification and asset allocation and having enough in cash, fixed interest property, Australian shares, international shares. And what this does is this reduce, reduces the risk of any one specific asset class and the volatility within that. So mm -hmm. if I've only got 30% exposure to Australian shares, for example, well, my loss is limited. It's almost quarantined to that. And I feel that sometimes during these really good years where everything seems to be rising in value, um, we can kind of forget about principles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's Warren Buffett famously says, you know, it's yeah. only when the tide goes out you see who's swimming <laughs> naked. And I feel that's that's what's happened a lot in, in the past certainly 12 months. And mm. prior to that, I think we had very good times. And it's now important that we're going back to the principles, first principles on how we invest. And to some extent, even resetting client expectations that the returns from yesteryear might not be as good going forward. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think the point you made before about allocating different asset classes is important. So. You know, generally when we start out, we, especially with retiree clients that are drawing on the funds, we always make sure we have at least three years of income set in stone straight away. So there's, you know, maybe a year in cash, a year in cash equivalent, and then another year in fixed income, mm -hmm. generally defensive. So no matter what happens in the market for that three year period, we're kind of covered. And then the income generated during that period can also top up that cash bucket as well. So in, in the end, you get four or five years kind of covered in terms of your income need. Yeah. So that's where you can kind of rest assured that if the market does have a dip in that period, you're not gonna have to sell down your shares on a lower value than when you bought them because you've covered that period of income. Mm -hmm. So you wait until the market recovers and then we'll trim the profit to, to top up that cash yep. rather than just selling during. So that's just a structuring thing we kind of do in terms of how to get your income out and, and be a bit more secure in retirement. I feel sometimes investors' worst enemy can be themselves. If they're yeah. constantly, if you're constantly logging in every day looking at your portfolio, it's not really something you can control. No, no. And no. Whereas, whereas if you've got that nice structure in place, it can give you a bit more certainty and possibly even profit mm. when markets go down because you do have that almost gunpowder dry in the cash and fixed interest segments or asset classes. Mm. You might be able to profit when from other people's panic. That's right. I mean, you just, you just want to make sure you're not panicking, capitalizing on the loss and then you know kicking yourself six months later when we check again and mm. the market's gone up. I mean, that's that's the worst pain really, knowing you've made that decision consciously to do that. And then you look back and you're like, oh, I wish I did nothing. I, I always think about that that movie, I think it was called Castaway with Tom Hanks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I remember he had the Wilson, the, the volleyball, and that was his best friend while he was away. And I often think, what did the share market do while he was away? He certainly wasn't worried about a share market. He wasn't. <laughs> He wasn't going in there every day trying to see what the price was. And yet, with all that volatility, he didn't look at it for, what, seven to 10 years. He came back and we know from historical numbers, the market would have been a lot worth a lot more than it was 10 years prior. So that's a strategy we should use. Send people to an island for <laughs> 10 years. We live on an island. <laughs> um, and I, I feel from a perspective of, from the client point of view, it's not a bad, bad thought process to think, okay, well, I know what will happen in 10 years. Mm. It will be better. There's never been a moment in the Australian share market that I've lost money over 10 years in the blue chip, the diversified portfolio. Yep. So volatility is a normal path of action. Um, and then if something that we've been talking about a lot internally is this Dalbar study. So you know this, this measures what the average market return, which is what we've just been talking about, mm. versus what the average investor return is. And so most people would automatically assume that the average investor return is the same as the average market return. Uh, but 
it's quite different in that over 30 years, there's about a 3.5% difference in what the, ac- the market return was versus the investor return. Mm. So the investor got 3.5% less than the market compounded each year for 30 years. That's a lot. Which is a massive number because of their behaviour. So if you compare that to if you just drop, you know, put your money into an index fund, for example, something that tracks the market, by doing, just doing that at the start and doing nothing in the, that period, just relaxing, you would have done 3.5% better than if you tried to trade. That's yep. the Dow Bar study, yep. essentially. 3.5% compounded each year for 30 years. Mm. I think in the 2021 year, it might have been the investment market did, this is the S&P 500 in America, yep. did 28%. And the investor return did something like 18%. So that shows you that every time the market goes down, these people are selling out because they're panicking. And I get that. There's, you know, there's a cycle of market emotions that we know that people go through. Mm. But really, they're probably not understanding their plan well enough that at that point, it's not the time to sell because sure enough, the best return actually comes when the market's at the lowest. Um, yeah, that makes sense. I, I suppose on that point, though, like when things are going down, like COVID, for example, everyone kind of look down like more downward like it is going to be the end of the share market and cap- mm. but yeah it's, it's, it is hard to bring yourself back from with, that with short term investing they definitely when it goes down they don't see it going down to here they project yeah, right. to there and then when it goes up they don't see it there they project up to there yeah and that's probably what happened with the cryptocurrencies and the bitcoins of the yeah, world that you know I missed it at 18 I've got to get on now at 30,000 I've got to get on at 60,000 and I know that my mate made money here, so now I'm going to put in more mm. but be, to try and catch up. Now, I think, again, that's probably that point around having some financial discipline um, is very important in very volatile markets. Do we think the volatility is here to stay? I think for now, for sure. I mean, while there's well, volatility comes from uncertainty, right? Mm-hmm. There'll be no, so while things, we don't know what's happening with interest rates, recessions and the like, I think volatility is still going to be there. There's not really much way around that. I think long term, once we get inflation under control and interest rates start to normalise or, or level out at least, mm-hmm. the uncertainty won't be so high, so the volatility will come back. But until then, I don't really see a catalyst to kind of bring things back. Yeah. So really from our perspective, it's keeping things invested in sort of the blue chip, the big end of town, yeah. diversified. You know, we looked at, uh, we went through some numbers the other day trying to see what the impact on Credit Suisse going broke on the the uh, X Y Z funds credit thing, and it was it was negligible. Yeah, like 0.02% or something like that. Point two yeah. percent. So that diversification principle matters. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, if you look in the last couple of months, the Australian share market has had uh, it's come back. It was a six percent month roughly in January, mm-hmm. and February March has been down about seven. So you've given back. What you got in January, right? You wouldn't have got the up if you sold out, and you wouldn't have got the down if you, if you stayed in, right? But the thing about that is, going forward, this is a blip in the system. This mm-hmm. isn't normal times. If you can hold your line throughout time, we know the average return in the share market, you know, roughly 10% in Australia for the last 50 odd years, yeah. but we're going to have these blips. But we didn't know January was going to be 6% month, we didn't know the last two months were going to be negative seven. Mm. Long term, we have a pretty good idea, I think. Yes. I feel when we look at that index and we know how all of them work over time, mm. you know, it's short term volatility. But volatility isn't just negative. Volatility doesn't mean that the market just goes down mm. because there's volatility on the way up as well. And when I look at that chart and anyone that's ever been in our offices will see the, the chart from nineteen fifty to, you know, the last year mm. and it starts in the bottom left corner. And it ends in the top right corner. And every time we show people this, they say, oh, geez, I wish my parents had invested, you yeah. know, $100, $1,000, $10,000 then. And although it never felt easy that whole time because there's a lot of volatility. And that's what we sort of talk about. There's Vs on the chart everywhere. That's our volatility. That's when the market goes down. I think for the, the younger people, the wealth accumulators, that volatility creates a great opportunity to really profit from that. I think for the retirees, that's the reason why you diversify and you have a plan in place that isn't dependent upon the performance 
only of a, of a fund of one mm. particular asset class. Talk about the difference in the last 10 years, interest rates were super low. Yeah. So we're not getting any interest in the bank. Yeah. It's terrible. <laughs> and so we were reliant on growth in portfolios, capital growth. Yeah. How's that now changed with interest rates going up? Yeah, interesting, good point. So, I mean, the last decade, we haven't had interest rates, as you said, so what was the acronym? It was TINA, there is no alternative, which essentially meant you're not gonna get income, so you need growth. There's two parts to a return, income and growth. If there's no income, you have to go more growth, so everyone was more exposed to share markets, I suppose, to get that growth, and that would have done them pretty well, because the growth was pretty great. Now that interest rates are back up, those fixed in cash even, fixed income, kind of government debt and those things, are producing an income now, say 5%. So with no growth, just looking at income, you're gonna get 5%, which is attractive now and it makes sense to allocate there. Is that relatively risk-free? Well, the good government, you know, bonds and things like that, mm -hmm. issued by the government, backed by the government, relatively secure, you, you, you'd assume. Yeah, okay with that. So if you get, say, right now, 4% income return off that, mm -hmm. Backed by the government, no share market risk there. That's starting to look a bit more appealing than a share market that's uncertain, volatile at the moment. So mm -hmm. having a mix of both allows you to play both sides of the field, lock in an income and still have exposure to growth. Yeah. So that starts to play on that that diversification concept that we yeah. touched on before. And so in that instance as well, you're not even though your volatile growth assets are going up and down, mm. because we're getting now more income in the portfolios, we're not gonna need to sell down those growth assets. Yeah. So now we, the one thing we ever want as investors is we want time. So now we've got the ability to have more time to write out those short term blips mm. until some certainty returns to the market. That's true. Well, the good thing about this for retirees especially that I really enjoy about it is, so we've allocated that cash that I said before, three mm -hmm. years of cash, four or three years of cash equivalent, so they're ready to go for the, the pension income. Now we've got this fixed income back in the system with the interest coming in. We direct that to that cash, which tops that up as you draw down from it. So say we get income in the portfolio now of 5%. If you draw 5% from your portfolio, the income generated is actually topping you up from what you're drawing. So you're kind of net net, mm -hmm. about the same. Whereas before we had to sell growth to fund the income. Yes. And growth is not certain, especially now. So the fact that income's back there takes the pressure off going more risk to get growth to sell back down. Get your income. So if I'm if I'm listening to this or watching this right now, I'm I'm thinking, okay, this cash is between four to five percent. Mm. Uh, that's really good. I only need to draw down that much. Yep. Why don't I keep it all in cash? Yeah, and I've had that question a lot lately. Mm -hmm. Actually, and it's a fair question. If you're looking at it now, you're like, I can lock in that four percent interest, risk free, or I can go to the share market and things like that and have the volatility. First, first point on that is inflation right now. The inflation's running at, in Australia about six, seven percent. Mm -hmm. So it means that everything's getting about six or seven percent more expensive a year, and you're going to get four percent income. So you're actually negative there. So the amount of income you're getting isn't compensating for the, the expenses going up. So you're in a negative real position. And the thing about cash is you don't have opportunity for growth. It's just going to be income. So your cash doesn't have the potential to grow to keep up with that inflation. So that's bit of an issue, I'd say. You're telling me that the bond values don't just give me income, they can also go up in value. <laughs> yeah, they can now. So the thing to note about bonds, and this is my favorite asset class at the moment, is with interest rates, their relationship. Really simply, if interest rates go up, bond values technically go down and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So now we get into the top of the interest rate cycle. Bonds are starting to become attractive because one, they're producing a good income, which is great, fantastic. The next point about that is you can potentially get some capital growth here if you take the long-term view and think that interest rates may peak and then they may come down a bit. If they come down a bit, interest rates going down, bond values go up, plus your income. You know, if you've got funds that kind of have this concept called duration, which means the effective interest rates is a bit more significant, mm -hmm. you know, we're potentially looking at double-digit returns on an almost risk-free asset going forward. And that's not taking share market risk, that's not doing any of that. This is government Still debt. Still a volatile asset because it was down 10, 12% last year. Last year had a shocker. So. But look what happened with interest rates last year. Yeah. Interest rates, one of the worst, worst, one of the most aggressive rate rising cycles you've seen. Uh, and what did I say about interest rates and bond values? Mm hmm. So effectively, the, the return this year, I pay $100 for my government bond that gives me 4%. Mm -hmm. But next year, 
I've got that hundred dollars I want to put in a government bond, I might only get three percent. Yeah. So from that perspective, my four percent bond is more valuable than my three percent bond. Yeah, so therefore goes that goes up in value. That's essentially the, that's the concept. So it's been painful to get here, but now we're here, the opportunities I feel are more than they were two years ago. Before yeah. COVID, before any of that kind of thing. Which is pretty exciting for for us. It, I mean, the whole idea isn't it to, is to take less risk to get more return. That's kind of our objective. Mm -hmm. So now that's becoming much more possible than it was a couple of years ago. Yeah, I think that's the evolution in, you know, the majority of our clients are pre post retirees, mm. you know, sitting on probably the higher net wealth side of side of things and from that perspective we're really trying to say okay let's reduce that drawdown risk that you know that volatility on the downside yeah while not giving up the opportunity when markets do run well mm. we don't want to give up that opportunity so that's why we don't want to put all our eggs in the cash basket yeah that's why we want to make sure that we are watching it talking to the fund managers talking to the experts reading all the economic reports to have the best estimate of what we think and kind of play out the different scenarios. You know, we we were fortunate enough to have dinner with Paul Keating a year ago and he was quite bullish on the fact that Russia would invade uh, Ukraine. And then we went to an investment conference the next day and two geopolitical experts said it wouldn't happen. Mm. So a lot of these things are out of our control. And so we understand behaviourally how that would impact clients. They would want to think, well, what do I need to do? And I think sometimes from that perspective, the sometimes do nothing is also a move. It's also a strategy. And wait till you've got better intelligence. I remember uh, Colin Powell, uh, who was you know in America during the Iraq War, uh, he would say, you know, if you if you go with three out of ten information, you've gone too soon. If you go with seven out of ten information, you've gone too late. So in our in our world. We kind of sit in that precipice, that, that uncertainty band uh, of trying to make the best move we can at that point in time. And every client would have heard me say it for the last six months, you know, when the facts change, our views should change. Yeah. You know, right now it is a different investing environment to what it was a year ago. Yeah. Back then we were told by the Federal Reserve in America, Australia's Reserve Bank, interest rates aren't going up. Inflation's not an issue. Then they come back and say, oh, sorry, it is an issue. So we can't invest now the way we were 12 months ago because now all the facts have changed. And I think sometimes, especially for reti retirees, especially when we're talking about the behavioral side of things, it's way more comfortable sitting in what we know and the strategy that we did. Mm. But what worked then might not work now. And I think that's the constant evolution and us retesting the ideas, the hypothesis to make sure what's the best path going forward. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes during COVID, we ask clients to draw less money out. You know, they weren't being able to travel, they weren't being able to do things, you know. Now, you know, it might be a period where they say they want to travel, but we know that the cost of travel has gone up through the roof. So the, these things are where we've always got to be flexible because we can't rely on the facts of, of yesteryear. So I think behaviorally, that's where people need to really work as a team mm, to help yeah. get through these, these tough times. Because who knows, and who knows how the next year is going to pan out. We're the third year of you know the COVID pandemic, yep. and interest rates rose till something broke. You know that was is it the whole banking system? The big fear there was contagion. It's probably not. Mm. I would think. I think you're probably right on that front. Not that I'm an expert in that area, but I mean, the U.S. government came in and backstopped. They mm -hmm. said they guaranteed deposits. So that kind of quelled the the fear, I guess, to a degree. Yeah. And unfortunately, with the Credit, credit Suisse kind of events, that wasn't a credit collapse necessarily like the GFC. Mm -hmm. That was purely built on sentiment and a run on that bank. Yes. And they got in trouble. Yeah. So they had to do something. But, um, but yeah, I don't think this is this is not a GFC or anything like that. So what's your advice to, to the people listening right now, mm. talking about the behavioural side of investing? What's your, your point to them to get through this current climate? to get through this current climate it's going to be really boring it's going to be it's going to be you know stay the course mm -hmm. you know, in the portfolios we're doing the quarterly rebalances um, and we're also reviewing it you know every, every 6 to 12 months as well but if there's a 
a macro change and a fax change will make sure it changes as well. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to try and time things, we're not going to try and change things on a whim, but now things like bonds are back, the fax have changed so we can change it with that. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to try and you know go to all the cash we might miss a run up in the next six months and miss out on 10% return, it's a negative outcome. This is not going to be reactive. We need to stay the course of the original strategy that was put in place. Because you know, we know long term that will work. You know, five plus years uh, investment horizon that will, that will work. Yeah. So, really, don't be reactive. Mm -hmm. Stick to the plan. And I'd probably add in make sure you're speaking with your advisor. Yeah. So, really make sure because we should be your source of truth. We're the ones, we've got access to information others can't have. We don't want someone acting off the information they got from their mate at the golf club. We have a lot of clients here that play golf. Uh, we don't want them to act off that information. We don't want them to act off something they see on Sunrise or uh, mm. Today Show or anything like that. Really sit down, reassess your plan if need be. And there's other things that come in when there is market volatility. There might be now someone qualifies for an age pension. Yeah. Uh, there might be other factors that, there's been superannuation changes recently where people can put more in. There's always superannuation so, changes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah. We, we do joke internally that the government keeps us employed by changing super every single year. Um, but from that perspective, I think it really is time to sit down with your advisor, test your plan, test your strategy, is it still the right strategy? Uh, and learn about the other investment opportunities because one thing we've really found, probably a handful of investment strategies that we now really believe in, mm. that because the facts have changed, that five years ago, we never even looked at. So I think that that's probably my closing point is really sit down, sit with your advice team, and then go from there. Because the one thing we always want is when you have peace of mind that you're gonna be okay and that you're gonna pass the sleep at night test. If we can do that, you're ahead of most of the people out there. So with that, I'd like to thank Bobby for your time. Pleasure. I'd like to thank everyone for watching. Have a great day. Bye.